I thought it would make sense to start with uh, sort of recent news in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so you returned recently from maternity leave after having your second daughter. Yes. And Is that news? That is not news. I mean, maybe. But no, that's not what we're here to talk about, although it's wonderful. Um, before you went on maternity leave, you felt like there were maybe a handful of competitors. Mm -hmm. You come back a few months later, and it's like the world has changed. Yes. What was your thought when you first saw these announcements of traditional brick and mortar retailers um, starting with a partner, their own rental services? Well, 10 years ago, I had a vision that the sharing economy could be applied to the closet. And it feels, I feel incredible validation now, 10 years later, that mainstream retailers and brands believe that rental is now a key part of their revenue mix and that they have to be in the rental business. Does it, how does it affect or impact sort of your strategy? Does it make you want to go public sooner? Does it make you want to, like how, how, how do you think about it internally? Well, as you just mentioned, you know, research reports are saying that within 10 years, 10% of this $2 trillion market is very likely going to be rental, which is a $200 billion market. So first, I believe that there are many different players that can win. However, the strategy that we have at Rent the Runway is one to make sure that the actual merchandise that is on our platform is designer brands, is for people who appreciate fashion and style. So I think it's even more important to focus on our assortment and the benefits that assortment brings to our user base, as well as how easy and frictionless the experience is for the user. So let's step back for a second. And for people who haven't followed super closely the whole evolution of the company and your offerings, today you still, are, you still have your core original, well, maybe not core anymore, your original business, which is sort of one-off rentals for special occasions, and then you have subscription. Can you just sort of lay that out and the different parts of the business? Yeah, so 10 years ago when I thought that there was a way to bring the closet into the cloud, I knew that no one rented clothes yet. So we had to start with something that had a very clear customer value proposition, and that was rent a dress for a special occasion. Over the past 10 years, we've evolved from special occasions to now every occasion. So there are loyal users who are using the service up to 120 days of the year for events as diverse as going to work or relaxing with your family on the weekends or maternity, going to the gym, going on vacation. And so the business now is really about a subscription to a new form of dynamic ownership, where we keep on um, giving you an endless assortment of products to choose from, and you can have those on continuous rotation in your lives. Six months ago, we launched two new categories onto the platform, kids and home. And both of those launches have actually been extremely well received by our users, meaning that people are not only using their Rent the Runway Unlimited subscriptions for their apparel, but are now using it to outfit their homes, for their kids' clothes. And I think that- And that's just built into the existing subscription? It's built into the existing user interface. I think that the more, assort, the more our catalog grows, in fact, the simpler the user experience should be to the user where you just have to personalize the experience and make sure that it's really easy for her to use. So I'm subscribing for $159 a month or $159 a month. Some days I may, or some months or sometimes I may want clothing. Mm -hmm. Other times I may you want have, for you my You start kids. off, your basic program gives you four slots and you can accordion up the number of slots you want or need based on what's going on in your life. So when I use the phrase dynamic ownership, what I mean by that is that in the past, the entire world of retail is based on you purchasing something, and the minute you purchase it, your life might change. Your closet is basically a reflection of who you are, who you once were. 
And a Rent the Runway subscription allows your lifestyle to change, your life stage to change, your mood to change, your taste to change. And because you have things on constant rotation, you don't have to feel trapped by what you've purchased in the past. Um, another uh, sort of news item in the space recently was uh, the announcement that Lord & Taylor was selling to Latote, uh, a company in the space, a young company. Um, what did you think when you saw that? First of all, did you look at Lord & Taylor? No. I have no interest in buying a traditional department store. Okay, so is that, was that your thought when you saw it, or what, what did you think? Well, I have a lot of respect for the founders of Latote, so I'm sure that there are some smart reasons for this that potentially I don't yet understand. Um, but I think that what I really took away from the announcement is just that the decay of the traditional way that the apparel industry has run, has, it's, it's gone forever now. We're in a new world where models like Rent the Runway and The Real Real and Stitch Fix are going to be the dominant players in how people are getting dressed. Your subscribers, what do you know about their purchase behavior still versus their rental behavior? Well, I know more about what they wear than I would guess any other retailer on earth because if she's using us to up to 120 days of the year, she's giving me data every single time she uses and wears something from Rent the Runway. Now interestingly, if you're in the business of selling products to people, your data ends at sell-through rate. You can attribute your product, you can figure out what you sold and how many units you sold of this particular SKU, but after it leaves the store and enters someone's closet, you have no idea what happened. You don't know how many times the user wore it, if it was in good quality, how she felt about it, if it actually fit her, et cetera. We're getting this post-order data that is helping to inform um, a huge part of actually what we buy in the first place. So we learn about fit issues that might exist with certain designer brands, and we take the, that data back to the brand to help them customize how they produce their inventory in the first place to fit a more personalized kind of assortment of users. So the, can you break down for us how much of the business is now subscription versus where you started, and then I'm gonna ask you some other finances questions. Okay, I'm, I'm happy for the preview. Um, over 70% of our revenue currently comes from our subscription, and that is growing astronomically year over year. We believe that subscription is the avenue to really bring the closet in the cloud to users. Now the reason why we have our special events business or even our lower price subscription product is because we want to offer different pathways to try rental for the first time and to experience the fact that it's sustainable, it's of high value, and it's actually more fun and smarter to rent. How did the economics work on a rental business as sort of intense as the one you have with the dry cleaning and the return logistics and all of that? Well, we, because logistics are such a core component to what we do, I mean, in reality, we are a logistics business because the experience of renting means that I have to bring the customer clothes in perfect condition, and then I have to get them back from the customer, restore them to perfect condition, and give them to another customer very quickly. So we've vertically integrated from the very beginning. So anything that we need to do to keep this dress looking amazing for as long as humanly possible is something that is now owned and it's owned by Rent the Runway. So that means dry cleaning, it means inventory repair, it means everything we do in our operation, our quality control process. And all of those processes are controlled and run by data. So data is informing our operation as much as it's informing our buying and planning processes. One of the challenges I've heard about the business when I talk to customers um, 
uh, I'm not yet a customer because you do not uh, care about men, but that's fine. You got a big, <laughs> big, big world. Men have enough people who care about them, I suppose. Um, and uh, I am actually so happy that you just didn't ask me a question of when are you going into men's. Um, I didn't, although I was like, am, I purchased this. Am I ever going to wear it again? Yes, you are, because okay. it's fabulous. OK, great. <laughs> Should I shout out the brand? Yeah, why not? Nah, no, they're free. <laughs> they didn't pay for anything. Um, <laughs> Uh, neither did you. Sorry, that was a bad. I won't go down that path. It's a bonobo. Sh it's a bonobo shirt. Um, good job. So, <laughs> where were we? Um, one of the challenges I hear about is for, for your physical locations, they can get crazy, crazy busy, mm -hmm. right? Um, I feel like that's a great problem to have. I mean, you tell me. Um, well, traffic is up to our physical retail locations 10x over the last two years. So whereas everyone else is talking about the apocalypse of traditional retail stores, we found a model where a physical experience is actually additive to your subscription. Now why? Because we've built the technology in that if you're a subscriber to Rent the Runway and you go to one of our stores, you can actually go to any a rack within the store, take any piece of apparel off the rack, scan it, and walk out the store becomes an extension of your closet. And what happens is you're discovering something visually that's new in the store. So you're seeing a brand that you might not have seen on the website before, you're seeing a new style. And so what we're finding in our stores is that women are making a visit to the store a part of their daily routine. Our busiest hours in the store are right before work or right after work because women are coming into the store to actually get dressed for the office. I was looking at the Google Trends yesterday and they show busy hours in one of your locations and it was like six, seven, eight o'clock or around there was just super peak. But, so that is a good problem to have, but it can also be a problem, right? Crowd, crowds can we, lead to com complaints about service times and all that. Definitely, I think that you know, utilizing the data that we have around the traffic and the hours of the day enables us to figure out where we're going to open up more physical locations and how we need to expand. I think that... How important is that expansion of physical? I think that the expansion of physical is both about providing an even more frictionless experience to the user, which is a key part of what we want to do. Because remember, we're competing against your closet. You can wake up in the morning and every person has a closet in their bedroom and they can walk up to that closet and wear, pick something out and wear something. So I need to remove friction from every part of my experience in terms of how easy it is for you to rotate and the stores are a key component to that. But I would also say that there are many users who don't live anywhere near a store and they're using the service with extreme frequency as well. So it's also about enhancing shipping times. Um, over the last year, we've removed an average of 24 hours from our turnaround time, which is... So turnaround in, time was what and is now? Turnaround time was between two and three days, and now it's below, and now it's one day less than that. So that means I returned, I returned something either by mail or at a physical location, and I'm... A, and I'm ordering something else and it's arriving now on average in? Now it's arriving two days later maximum. If you live in New York and you return something in the morning, you can actually receive something by that evening. Um, and you you're now have partnerships, right, where you don't only have to, you have sort of return partners essentially. Yes, we do. Um, how core is that to the logistics piece? It's just another service that we provide to our user base. I think it's amazing that we get free real estate at WeWorks and Nordstrom's to set up these drop boxes where our users can come in if it's on their way to work or on their way home, drop something off and it immediately opens up a slot for a new user. So you, you watching this WeWork IPO talk recently? I am. In fact, the president of WeWork is on our board. I was going to say they might be charging you soon, but I guess not if he's on your board. <laughs> you know, I think that we selected WeWork as a partner because uh, they are 
amazing at picking out incredible real estate locations. And if you're gonna go for convenience to our user base, who primarily is a woman in her 20s, 30s, or 40s who works, they have absolutely the best locations that are within one or two blocks of where our core users are working all throughout the country. Um, there was a recent Wall Street Journal article that talked about some of the challenges of growth, customer service challenges, um, Trying to and try to figure out, you know, whether to focus on. Uh, well, let's start that. Where customer service challenges. You said you're. You didn't give a number of how fast you're growing, but you said astronomically or something like that, which could be forty percent or a hundred percent, something in between. Do you, you want to? Well, I think the article that you just referenced from the Wall Street Journal. I believe that businesses need to have a new type of contract with their customers. And that, co that contract has to be one of absolute authenticity and realness. So when we make a mistake, I don't know what that mistake is. And in this case, our subscription business was growing quicker than how quickly we had planned to hire customer service agents. So we didn't have enough agents to actually handle the demand and the frequency with which our subscribers were using the service. We sent out an I'm sorry note, and we not only said I'm sorry to our users, but we said here's what we plan to do, and here's the time that it's going to take us to do that. Now that's a very- And it was resulting in what? The, challenge, the, the customer the, service The customer problem. service times were resulting in long wait times if you had an issue. Primarily that was the biggest issue, that if you tried to get in touch with us, whereas it normally we're very, you know, responsive and will respond immediately, it was taking some time for us to get back to you. So we sent out a apology email. And what was surprising was the Wall Street Journal reporter, she called us and she's like, well, there must be something else that's very wrong. We're like, no, really, like we specifically said to our customers, this is what's wrong and this is what we're doing to solve it. I think it's so unusual for businesses to be honest about what's going on. I think that you have to almost pretend as a CEO or as a business that everything is always perfect. And I actually think that our customers are very well informed. They're very smart. We've had a long-term relationship with them. We're not always going to be perfect. We are growing. And in fact, when we admit when we make mistakes and we actually are very transparent about what we're doing to fix them, that that creates a very different type of relationship with our users and they become more loyal. And we've actually seen that over the past 10 years, that we've on many different occasions raised our hands and said, you know what? We messed up, and here's why, and here's how we're going to do better later. And we let our customers actually call us when we're not being, when we're not following through. What um, this is a new type of service, even ten years in, a lot of people are trying for the first time. What does the churn of your subscriber base look like? So the loyal. Churn is not a metric that I'm going to give out. However, it's a small room. <laughs> yeah, that's broadcast everywhere. Just a few reporters. What we really focus on, I, what I will tell you is that it is a new behavior. So what's really important is how do I teach the user how to subscribe to fashion and how to use, utilize this over the first 90 days of her subscription, where if We've learned that if we don't educate her on how to use subscription, if we don't personalize the experience for her, that she's more likely to churn because it's something that is completely new. In fact, when you talk about competition, one thing I'm excited for is that in a world of competition, all I have to be is the best rental service or the best subscription service, which I am very confident that we are and will continue to be. I no longer have to, if you've tried a competitor, I don't have to educate you on how the dynamics of rental works. Like you wear it, then you put it back in the garment bag, then you return it to UPS. Like there's actually some technicalities to how this works in terms of logistics. So I think that we're really focused on the first 90 days and figuring out how do we usher people into the experience in a, the most hand-holding type of way. 
do you have to focus um, your business on sort of at some point making sure you're keeping your best customers versus the growth of new customer acquisition? And if not, how do you how do you sort of balance that priority? So we've always benefited from the fact that Rent the Runway has grown organically. We've had an incredible community from the get-go, and over 90% of our acquisition has come through other customers over the past 10 years. So acquisition hasn't been something that we've had to really work on or worry about. Now, why? It's because, let's say you are a Peloton user. Your Peloton bike is in your house. Your Rent the Runway is on your body. I'm a walking billboard for Rent the Runway over 100 days of the year. And my clothing sparks conversations, especially with other women who tend to compliment each other, who love to share a great life hack or a way to save time. So we've seen that in offices or in college campuses and apartment buildings in cities, Rent the Runway actually has true network effects where the community, there's virality to it and then there's a stickiness that happens if you all do it together. We just learned that there are Slack channels all over the country at hundreds of different companies where the Slack channels are Rent the Runway Unlimited and people in offices as diverse as American Express or Goldman Sachs or Equinox will actually ask other colleagues, hey, did you rent that? How did it fit? Or how did you it? And that creates incredible acquisition um, and people who are willing to try the service but also continue to be loyal to us. I think that internally, to get back to your question, yeah, we're focused I, on loyalty. You were on a roll. Loyalty. So. We're focused on constantly improving the user experience and making a commitment to ourselves that quarter over quarter, we're gonna be offering a better experience to our users because our assortment is gonna be better and our experience, the ease of use is gonna be better. And you can make that experience easier via technology. You could also make it easier via logistics. We've talked a little bit in the past uh, recently about your belief that Rent the Runway can and will be a public company. Um, how much of your time are you spending right now either thinking about that or planning for that reality? Well, for the past 10 years, I've spent, I've spent uh, a good amount of my time with my CFO partnering on ensuring that we have the capital to continue our growth plans. And so that is no different today. And I, I expect to be in that business for you know, quite a while. Um, when it, I think that what you're getting at is with a service like Rent the Runway, where both the team is primarily female and our user base is 100% female, we've had to do more education in the investor community as to why this is such a revolutionary concept and why the closet in the cloud is something that is going to change this $2 trillion apparel industry forever. So I, un I unfortunately believe that I have to spend relatively more of my time than let's say a CEO whose business is something that investors use, like Peloton. I have to spend more time explaining why we, how our, how our service works and why we have a right to exist. So are you, are you at a point where you're talking to public market investors because you're that close to deciding that we should start on the IPO path? Well, our last round that we just raised in March was led by two public market investors, yeah. Franklin Templeton and T. Rowe Price. We've been very strategic over many years of building those relationships and doing whatever education that we need to on what our service is and how it works because you're only allocated a certain amount of time and I have found that the major crime and penal the major penalty that exists for female CEOs is that I have to waste 25% of my time explaining what my business does. Imagine if I'm the CEO of Peloton, I have to spend exactly zero seconds explaining what my business does because every investor has a Peloton in their house. So that's the difference where if I have done that pre-intro beforehand, I can get into the actual meat and potatoes of our numbers, our metrics, our unit economics, and our growth plans, which is what I want. I think that 
every, I know we're out of time, but the- No, we can ignore this, but people should line up for some questions. The, um, and I'll I think get to about you. what I want for female founders and female CEOs. All I want is to be evaluated based on my data. That's it. This is an industry that claims that it's a data-driven industry. In my experience over the past 10 years, I've found that it's a lot more emotionally driven than um, the industry gives itself credit for, and therefore. What do you mean by that? We hear a lot about audiences of one. I have to spend time and talking to investors as to why their wife might or might not use my product, as opposed to looking at our data, which speaks for itself. So that's all I want is to present my data and have it speak for itself. And I believe that the public markets will give us that opportunity. Let's talk a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll get to you in one second. Let's talk uh, for a second about um, that data. Um, I, in a recent report, I think the number that was published was around 100,000 uh, subscribers at Rent the Runway today. Is that, is that a number you? you can confirm, and then I'll do back of the envelope math on your revenue, and you could talk about profitability. <laughs> That's not a number that I can confirm. We've never confirmed or talked about our subscriber count, but all I can tell you is that our subscriber count continues to grow over 100% year over year, and that right now we are trying to enhance our assortment as quickly as possible so that we could give, we could actually fulfill the demand that we have. I'll take a question here. Please tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Ron Bodkin with Google Cloud. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'm, I'm curious about those metrics, right? Like what are the kind of metrics that are unique that your innovative business is generating and how do you use them to drive that constant quarterly improvement in, in the customer's experience? Yeah, so one metric that we look at that is unique to rental is utilization rate. So how often is this dress utilized on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and how we can um, increase its utilization over time? So it's a metric that's more similar to is that a, Is that how many times someone can wear it? Yeah, that's what percentage of the time it's actually the utilization rate is what percentage of the time it's at home with a customer being used. Now there's two ways that you can enhance utilization. One is you can uh, minimize your turnaround time. So you can improve how quickly you're able to get it to a uh, user so there's less non-value added time. Another thing that you can do is you can buy better inventory, have better inventory, display it or personalize it better on the site so that it's, it's requested more by users. So we're constantly looking at a utilization rate. We're looking at wear rate, which is that just because someone has something at home and it fits them, doesn't mean that they necessarily wear it. We then look at a whole host of um, data related to fit. And I think that we have huge opportunity at Rent the Runway to standardize and create a new fit criteria for the industry because we're mapping hundreds of millions of data points on our users with data points on our inventory. And when someone tells us this dress doesn't fit, I happen to know about the user, her height, her weight, her chest size, her hips, where it doesn't fit. So we're able to really attack on a personalized basis with our brands, how do we enhance fit? which is their biggest problem, and it's one of the biggest problems in retail. Would you consider, would there be a need to acquire techn a technology company that focuses on fit, or you believe you are, you are that company? Well, I certainly believe that we're the data company that focuses on fit, whether there are front-end UX applications out there that focus on fit and are think that come to the market and build massive adoption, and then I'll use them like everyone else. If we have any more questions, we'll take another one. Um, I have, I'm gonna squeeze in two more for you, if not. One is, are you surprised that Amazon has not made an attempt um, to get into rental? I have no idea what 
attempt Amazon is making or not making into rental. I think it's naive to think that they're not doing this right now. Like, you have to behave as the CEO as if Amazon is in your market. Because if they're not in it today, they're probably going to be in it tomorrow. So I am constantly thinking about the strategy of Rent the Runway um, in a world where Amazon is part of the mix. I have two more for you, actually. I lied. Um, one is, uh, actually, let's take, take this audience question, and then I'll squeeze in one more. Hi, I'm Heather Lee, and I'm with Curtis. I actually asked a question yesterday, too, so I'm back. But um, I was wondering, as a female, I mean, for female founders who are in that startup phase, if you see the landscape changing, or do you think the challenges that you face are still pretty real? And like, what advice do you have for female founders? I am very encouraged by All Raise and what they're doing to provide female can tell, founders. Can you tell people what that is if they don't know? All Raise is an association of all of the top female venture capitalists and a lot of the top female founders who are providing tools and networks to other women to pay it forward to help them enter this world. But the, if you just look at the data, it's not getting any better. And the reason for that is that women don't control the capital. You know, it's not about the number of female investors. What access do they have to write big checks? And what power do they have at their firms? So until women, not only more women in the industry, Uh, we won't see more investment um, invested in Rent the Runway. The deal was led by a woman. I believe that our deal would had female investors not led the charge. So I think that we need to examine the industry and why, and examine why there aren't more diverse sets of investor across every metric, not just gender. You come back here two years from now. What does the sort of product and category assortment of Rent the, Run a Rent the Runway subscription look like, or how has it changed from today? I believe we'll be in many more categories so that you'll be using your Rent the Runway subscription for everything in your life that you don't really have utility for all 365 days of the year. I think that we'll be in even more diverse when it comes to apparel. I think there are lots of different categories of apparel where we still don't play. We need to offer a selection for all different segments of women. We found that when we um, actually increase the number of brands on Rent the Runway, increase the style types, increase the categories, what it does is it increases TAM. Different customers, that appeals to different cu new customer segments. And the customers we do have engage with us more. So our catalog is a way to breed more people to come to Rent the Runway and for our users to use us more frequently because they now have utility when they're pregnant, when they just got back to work, when they're going skiing, when they're going to the beach. You know, I need to offer them options for every single thing that may happen throughout their lives. And in that two year period, would you expect or hope to be a public company when you came back here as well? <laughs> I would think that would be amazing. But we have, you know, part of the reason why we raised, raised this last round is we wanted to give ourselves the financial control to figure out the best timing for Rent the Runway and not be under any pressure from a timing perspective um, to do something before we're ready or when the market's to be able to hopefully time this appropriately for the very best outcome. That's the best I'm going to get out of you, huh? Okay. Yeah, if, if I knew the timing, I would tell you, but I don't. Great. We're going to make it. We want to maximize value. I've been building this for 10 years, and there's a team of people that have been building this with me for 10 years, and we want to have an outcome that we're all extremely proud of. Great. Thank you, Jennifer.